Support this podcast via our Patreon and get more writerly goodness. Visit patreon.com slash nanocast to join up. Welcome to NaNoWriMo Every Month. My name is J. Daniel Sawyer. I'm the author of some 20 books, 34 short stories, and numerous articles and other things. And I am your guide on this journey to use NaNoWriMo to level up to professional output levels. Welcome to The Questions, Episode 27. Sergeant Mike asks, What are some good exercises for us to use to improve our craft? Is there a workbook, etc., that you'd recommend to prompt these training tools? Sarge, that is an exceedingly good question, and I actually put off answering it for a long time because I didn't have a reading list ready to hand. And after a long time, I still don't have a reading list ready to hand because life has been interfering and I've had other things going on and I haven't got to it. So I'm just going to try to answer your question as best I can with a few ways to develop exercises for yourself. But before I get to that, I'm going to comment that many of the writing workshops that you will go to that are taught by pros, like workshops given by Dave Farland slash Dave Wolverton or Kevin J. Anderson or Christine Catherine Rush or Joyce Carol Oates or Holly Lyle or whatnot, they will include good writing exercises for you as part of the homework. And... um if you hold on to your homework, you'll begin to notice some techniques for developing those exercises that you can extrapolate to develop exercises for yourself. A lot of what I'm about to tell you is from that kind of an extrapolation technique. Um, also, I seem to recall way, way back in high school days, um, the literature and creative writing textbooks having writing exercises in the back. Those still work at whatever craft level you're at. So if you've got one of those hanging around, you can pull from there. The Writing Excuses podcast, they give a lot of business advice I don't agree with, and they're very into a method of rewriting that I think is destructive. But that said, they do have a lot of expertise between them and a lot of good suggestions. And one of the great things about their podcast is that they tend to end almost every episode with a writing prompt. And that's a good place to pull exercises from. And frankly, it's a good podcast to listen to anyway, because you, know, you shouldn't be listening to just one guy's opinion. You're going to find stuff that I say that works for you that you'll want to take and stuff that other people say that works for you that you want to take. And it's very doubtful that you'll find everything I say works for you or everything someone else says works for you because you're an individual and everybody's path, particularly everybody's artistic path, is going to be very different because your artistic path comes out of who you are. Now, how to develop your own writing exercises. The first thing to do is when you have a book or a film or any kind of fiction that leaves you with a, whoa, how'd they do that, man? Try to do that. If it's a book, you can just type in what's in the book. And for some people, that really helps cement what's going on on a subconscious level, even when they haven't consciously picked it apart. Or you could try retelling the story that is told in the book with the serial numbers filed off. This is a technique from ancient Greece called mimesis, the way they used to teach rhetoricians and storytellers to write properly, was to have them rewrite the Odyssey or the Iliad, something from Homer, with their own spin. Some examples of mimesis that have happened in the present day are, O oh brother, where art thou? is mimesis. It is, in fact, explicitly based on the Odyssey. A lot of travel narratives, Robinson Crusoe, whatnot, descend from the Mimesis tradition. There's a book called The Homeric Epics and the Gospel of Mark, which examines how Mimesis, as a literary technique, helped in the writing of the Gospels, particularly of the Gospel of Mark on which the other Gospels are based. It's a fantastic technique for learning how to tell stories well. So when you're reading a story that's really working for you and that's having an effect on you that you want to duplicate, 
try retelling that story with the serial numbers filed off and duplicating those effects. It usually works best with short stories, but you can do it with full novels. Fifty Shades of Grey was a series of novels based on a mimesis of Twilight. That's kind of a macro-style writing exercise. A more micro-style writing exercise is to choose a favorite film scene. It can be a scene from any film, and write that scene from the point of view of one of the characters in the scene. And then, once that's done, go back and write that scene from the point of view of the other characters in the scene, and see what kind of dynamics you can evoke. And do it with different concentrations. Um, you can do that for point of view, where you hop around the point of views in the scene and explore how that changes the way the scene unfolds emotionally, even when all the facts are the same. Then do the same sort of exercise with the same scene or with a different scene for the purposes of building suspense or building emotional tension or creating cliffhangers or evoking subtext. Any of these different sorts of things you need to do as a writer you can do by copying down a movie scene and jiggering with its details and investing deeply in one point of view or another, or in one aspect or another of an omniscient point of view. Writing prompt exercises are fantastic. This is where you pull a book off a shelf, you pick a random line, and that's the first line in your story, and you write a story from that line. Writing prompt from titles. You can do the same sorts of things. You can pick titles you like, or you can create titles by mashing two different titles together. Like if you mashed Moby Dick and the Garden of the Gods together, you'd get the Garden of Dick, and you can write a story about the Garden of Dick, which could be a pornographic story, or it could be a story about a guy named Richard who has a fantastic garden, or it could be what have you. You can have a lot of fun with it. You can do writing exercises keyed to music. This is... A bit of an oddball one, I know. This is actually one of my favorites, um, because I'm a real music geek. I'm about as close as you can get to being a complete music geek without being a highly trained musician. But if you listen to a piece of music, whether it's a rock song or a jazz piece or a piece of classical music, and use that as a prompt to write a story or a character that matches the mood and the mood flow or the lyrics and the lyrical flow in those songs... I've got a character in my science fiction series, Alyssa Hartman. She is based on two songs. She is based on Shape of My Heart by Sting and Discotech by U2. Something about those two songs suggested to me two different characters, and then as I started developing those characters, I realized that if those characters were two sides of the same person's personality, that would make a really good dynamic character, and that's how I got that character, or at least the seeds for that character. And that leads you into a whole set of uh, ways to develop character-building exercises, aside from just doing point-of-view type of exercises. Developing characters from real people can be a lot of fun. Developing them from psychological profile types can be another. Developing characters from mannerisms is one of the most fun sorts of uh, exercises I've done. This is something that you learn in uh, acting class. When you're having trouble getting your hands on a character, for some reason the character you've been cast as is not connecting with you, you can bring in some kind of mannerisms that have nothing necessarily to do with the script and use those mannerisms and how they bounce off the words that your character is supposed to say in order to create the inner life of the character. So mannerisms and eccentricities like a habit of fidgeting with everything, a compulsion to play cards... The fact that the character is a teetotaler. That's unusual. If the character is a teetotaler for non-religious reasons, that's more unusual. And if the character is a teetotaler for non-religious reasons and reasons having nothing to do with an addictive personality or a parent who is an alcoholic, that's even more interesting. And use that kind of an iterative process to explore a character in dialogue or in a scene that's exploring the character's inner life. It's an iterative process. It's like those decision tree infographics you see where, you know, you're asked, you know, how do you arrive at if it's time for coffee? Is it morning? Yes, it's time for coffee. If the answer is no, it takes you to another box and then eventually leads you back to it's time for coffee. You all know the kind of decision tree diagrams I'm talking about. Going through a decision tree and taking the unlikely answer to create unlikely paths can help you develop very good, interesting, unlikely characters. 
Oh, what's another writing exercise? Writing stories that deliberately subvert an anthology premise. This was an exercise I did a while ago that netted me one of my favorite stories called The Society of Miserable Bastards. I was offered a um, chance to submit to an anthology about prom nights, one night stands, and secret babies. And I hate all three of these topics with a burning, bleeding passion. I haven't read stories like that since I was in high school, and I'm very glad I haven't read stories like that since I was in high school. But I was feeling kind of bloody-minded, so I figured, what the hell, I may not get into the anthology, but I'll make a good uh, story out of it anyway. And so I wrote the first title that came to my head was The Society of Miserable Bastards. And it indeed is about a secret society of illegitimate children who are miserable about the fact. So subverting a form deliberately is a great exercise. Your basic mechanics of writing are um, your voice and your sensory details and your plot. We've already talked a little about character. For sensory details, one of the classic exercises is to limit your character's senses. Step into a blind character's head, or have them blindfolded, or have an explosion have taken away their hearing, or for some reason the sense of touch is not working, the sense of taste. Limit yourself, either by plot contrivance or just for the fun of it, to one or two senses at a time, and write the same scene using sense words that only pertain to those senses. And make the descriptions as grippy as possible. Really try to saturate that paragraph or that set of paragraphs with that particular sense. And then cycle through all the five senses in the same scene. And that will help you develop your ability to add sensory details to any scene. Because what happens is most of us gravitate towards usually using sight and sound and not very frequently using anything else in our descriptions. And um, that makes writing feel flat and ordinary. Whereas when you limit what descriptions you're allowed to use to things that aren't sight, then you force yourself to either use terms that can cue both sight and another sense, like touch or scent, like an orange has sight, texture, scent, taste, right? Or coffee has sight and scent and touch and taste if you're actually holding the mug and drinking the coffee and whatnot. When you limit yourself to using only those words, you force yourself to develop depth in your writing and efficiency, and that makes your writing quicker and more engaging with the reader. Now, I was also talking about tools of voice. Um, one of the great ways to develop voice and voiciness is to learn dialect. Do exercises where you're setting a scene or giving a very short story. I'm talking 100 words, 200 words at most of a character in a situation with a problem, if you can get to it, where the character is speaking in a very thick accent. Because accent is not just about how you speak, comrade. It's also about the words you choose and words you choose to leave out. Because a Georgian, a proper upper-class Georgian, would avoid saying certain things that a grizzled biker would fucking say no matter what asshole was listening. And this is true of all accents and classes. Every dialect has its own code. And if you learn to write in those different codes, you've got a much better grasp and control over voice. It's not the only aspect of voice control, but it's a very good one to study because a lot of the others that are important for voice control are implicit in accent. So attempt to write in dialect. Again, as one 200-word exercises, or try to write entire short stories in dialect. Another set of tools for voice control are your, and we're getting fairly advanced here, are your consonants, assonance, dissonance, rhythm, and alliteration. These are poetic tools. If you study the basics of poetry, you learn how to pull sounds together, and you learn about how to scan a poem. Scanning a poem means looking at a poem and discerning the rhythm. So, for example, in the first line of The Raven, you've got once upon a midnight dreary. Once upon a midnight dreary. That's 
what's called four feet, where you've got a stressed and an unstressed syllable across the whole line. So it's in what's called trochaic quatrameter. Trochae means da da, and quatrameter means four feet, and the meter is the line. So that's poetic meter and scansion. And that rhythm in the poem drives the poem like crazy. You, the raven would not be the raven if it didn't scan the way it does. Now, constructing scanned poetry in your uh, fiction is not exactly the point here. That can make things really contrived. But the principles of rhythm that you learn by studying metered poetry are directly applicable to the way that you drive tension and voice and build uh, things in the scene. And if you want to use it, you need to study it enough that it's just sort of on your mental bookshelf and you pull it off without thinking and just... In you learn how different clusters of words and syllables and constructions sound and they seep their way into the way that you write. So that's a fairly advanced technique, but you can practice it by writing deliberately in meter as an exercise. Pick a meter, any meter, iambic pentameter, trochaic hexameter, which is one of my favorites, tetraic quatrameter, whatever you want, and um, write in that meter in order to learn what that meter can do for you, and then change meter and figure out what that meter can do for you. Alliteration is, of course, using the initial sound of every word to have them be the same, the initial sound, the, the first letter. For example, you could have a ghost hunter go crazy, and you could talk about the paralytic paroxysms of the parapsychologist, and you would uh, have a lot of fun. And that kind of thing will get you a comic effect, but using smaller doses of alliteration will um, is very effective. Assonance is where you use similar vowel sounds across words to create a sense of homogeneity or of driving something. That you can use it, depending on the vowel sounds, to create senses of peacefulness and whatnot. Consonance is where you do the same thing as assonance, but you do it with consonants. So um, pitter-patter. Those are consonant words. Clammy mammals is another set of consonants. There's a lot of consonants in The Raven. That's one of the poems that I memorized years and years ago, which is why I keep bringing it up. Actually, two wonderful poems to study are uh, The Cremation of Sam McGee by Robert Service has some fantastic assonants in it. There are strange things done beneath the midnight sun by the men who moil for gold. All those wonderful round sounds that give you this sense of doom. And then The Raven, which has uh, fantastic consonants in it, such as, Ah, distinctly I remember it was in the bleak December when each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Notice all the S's, the T's, and the B's all through there give you this sense of doom as well as the sense of groundedness going through this sense of ordinariness that's just crackling at the edges with promise. These are different techniques that poets use to create their effect in metered poetry. They are very, very useful and applicable for fiction writers if you learn how to use them. Another exercise you can do is write a scene using consonants, assonance, dissonance, which is where you set up an assonance and then you deliberately divert from it in order to create a sense of unease, alliteration, metrics, all that sort of thing. That was a hell of a rabbit trail and I didn't mean to take off for so long. But that's the way that you develop exercises for yourself. Figure out the things that you want to improve and then write scenes that concentrate on those things that force you to avoid the tools that you're most comfortable with and use the tools that you don't quite know how they work and work them over and over in that exercise format so that you get familiar with them and can employ them in your writing with some degree of facility and have a beta reader or a friend or a partner go over those exercises and grade them for you. Have them tell you when you cheated and slipped the wrong kind of sense in, or when you hit all of your alliterative cues properly, but you cheated by including philosophy in the P's or something. Anyway, um, 
that went on long enough that my voice is starting to get a little tired. So I'm going to go and I'll see you guys all tomorrow. NaNoWriMo Every Month is written and presented by J. Daniel Sawyer and produced by Artistic Whispers Productions. Visit our website at NaNoWriMoEveryMonth.com and leave a tip in the tip jar or join the Patreon to support this podcast. NaNoWriMo Every Month is copyright 2016 by J. Daniel Sawyer and Artistic Whispers Productions and is released under a Creative Commons non-commercial attribution no derivatives license.